this with mush up the black system. Live on unity. You can't conquer it. Hey friends, once again, you're listening to the Hope and Hard Pills podcast, where we are talking about practical insight for racial justice and social change. I'm your host, Andre Henry, singer, songwriter, and author. And for the past several years, I've been on a serious intellectual quest to understand how do ordinary people work together to change the world. And some of you have been a part of that journey. Thank you for being a part of that journey. I'm specifically talking to you guys who subscribe to my email list and those who support this show on Patreon. You can be a part of that journey as well by going to patreon.com slash Andre Henry. If you love the show, you want to be a part of the work, want to make sure it keeps happening. Um, The music today is brought to you once again by our artists. It's not by me today, uh, even though I'm your favorite singer-songwriter. At least that's what I tell myself in the morning when I brush my teeth. But Trish's is with us on the show, and we are playing Trish's music featuring a, a song from her today from their debut album. Yes. The name of the album is The Id. We're advanced, been enhanced, got our morals refinanced, we are evolved, problem solved, got our savage sins absolved, we got white teeth, cars are shiny, keep our floors clean, so they're blinding, we wear big sunglasses, pink lipstick, like they won't wear So, Trish's singer songwriter, performance artist, activist, public intellectual. I'm just calling you public intellectual now. I oh. love that. I now everyone's gonna have to refer to me as public intellectual. So let it be written. So let I'm it be done. I'm going to demand it. <laughs> I demand it. You did not list all of my epithets. <laughs> it says right here. In it's my going bio. in the bio. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show today, Trisha. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's such a it's such a joy. So I I pretty much ask everyone this when they first come on the show because, you know, there it's one thing for other people to describe how they see you, but how would you describe your own work? Like how do you see yourself? So Trisha's is a multimedia project that I created to express the different aspects of myself. Mm. And my goal is really to help people address their internal struggles because I feel like internal conflict is the foundation of all external conflict. Mm. I love this connection that you're making. It's such a big theme in your work because I feel like, I mean, I, I follow you online. So like I see the music videos and I see the 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 posts that are around social justice. And as as an artist who also is passionate about social justice, I always feel like sometimes people like want to put these things in separate compartments, right? There are advocates and there are activists and then there are artists and artists are just supposed to create entertainment for us. And so I love the way that you are um, bringing these two things together. Could you say more about that? Like all external conflict being linked to internal conflict. And, And is that partly why like the social justice aspect of what you do is kind of baked into your content and your art? Yeah, I think, Trisha's happened around a time where I was grappling with the idea of morality Hmm. and trying to understand what is the point of morality? Mm -hmm. How does one decide what their morality is? Right. And it's also around the time that I started learning about implicit bias and connecting those two things, I think is really the seed of why my art is so political because a lot of people call it psychological. And to me, it's like all of this one messy human thing. So I really feel like all of our human conflict come from a suppression of fear and shame. Mm. So that's why all of, with pr- police brutality, all of these officers would be like, but I'm not racist mm-hmm. because people are so afraid to look at the dark, shameful things within themselves, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. So until someone's willing to admit the fact that they could have biases based on race Mm -hmm. that are based on fear, 
that are based on identity, then they're not going to be able to address the core issue. Hmm. So as much as I think structural change is incredibly important, yeah. this inner work is also incredibly important yeah. for all of us um, as a society to be able to say we all have these biases that are based in shame and fear. Mm. And until we allow ourselves to address those biases and address those feelings, I don't think we can see permanent change. Yeah. No, that, I mean, I, I think, well, I agree with you, you know, like this, there's so many ways that people talk about this. Like in conventional warfare, we talk about like the, the moral part of the struggle, right? Um, and I think in, in direct action language, I've heard one describe it as the symbolic contest, right? And Michael White, co-founder of Occupy Wall Street, talks about like how the greatest battles before us are spiritual when it comes mm. to changing the world. And when he says spiritual, like he's not talking religion. He's just saying like, it's in our imagination. It's, it's what's going on internally inside of us, you know, that we're fighting on. And this is partly why I don't, I actually... <laughs> haven't interviewed a lot of artists on my show, you know, like uh, this season is like probably the most artists we've had on the show. And what I appreciate about the way that artists are engaging is that you are like doing very important work in that symbolic part of the change that needs to happen. Cause like an army could raise the entire oppressive system to the ground tomorrow. But if the way that we think, and if our values remain the same, we'll just have the same system rebuild. We'll itself. just re- the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So tell us about the id. Tell us about your album. So the id is me addressing these things within myself Mm -hmm. because the most effective thing most of us can do is hold a mirror to ourselves, Mm -hmm. Um, both because it changes the way we interact with the world, but Mm -hmm. because it allows other people to do the same thing. So in the id, I do refer to greater structural things, but it really is my conversation with myself, like Mm -hmm. my conversation with God or the universe or whatever you would believe in asking these questions about like, why do we have these conflicting desires? Mm -hmm. Like, why would we be created that way? Mm -hmm. Because it seems so painful. And so the, it is my examination of my deepest wounds that Mm. inflict violence in the world. Mm. Are you familiar with the language, the personless political? No. Okay. I mean, this came out of like some early feminist movements where they were talking about how like, you know, women were identifying what their lives were like at home. You know, they're like sitting together in groups talking about their lives are are like at home. And in doing that, they started to see that like, oh, like, my personal dissatisfaction is actually connected. It's a collective problem and structural issues. And I feel like that's what I was hearing in you describing, like, I mean, kind of the conversation we've had up to now and like also saying like you're confronting those things within yourself, you know, that I hear the personal and the political in what you're doing, which, you know, I appreciate. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) No, totally. And I think it's interesting because with art, a lot of the times you create it without knowing what it's about. Mm -hmm. So there were certain songs, like the first single I released off of the id is called Venom. And when Mm -hmm. I wrote it, I thought it was about me being an angry person. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, no, this is about society projecting anger onto me. Mm. Like, I'm, I'm not angry. I live in a very flawed world. And I'm still a fairly joyful person. Mm. But anger was and is so often projected onto me and women of color in general. So for so long, I thought that's what I was. Mm -hmm. Like society had convinced me of that. And it's only after the song was already completed that I could look back at it and be like, oh, this song is actually about anger being projected onto me. It's Mm. not actually about me being angry. Wow. Wow. What do you hope that people will take from this project when they listen to it? And and also when they view your videos, because like you have some really compelling visuals that you've been putting out too. Thanks. I just hope that it 
allows people to observe these things within themselves with a little less judgment because mm-hmm. I think the judgment is what causes the suppression. Mm. And if we don't judge those feelings, we can just look at the feelings. Like I yeah. always think about it as I'm talking to a little me. Mm. And if you're talking to a child and they're really upset, they're really angry, you're not going to like yell at the child. Mm-hmm. You're not going to tell the child to shut up. You know, you want to find the underlying cause of this emotion. Mm. Like, are you actually hungry? <laughs> Yeah. You know, like I heard this great thing um, that this mom would do when her child would fall. Mm. She would ask, are you hurt or did you get scared? Mm. Like, are you crying because you got scared or did you get hurt? Mm -hmm. And I'm just hoping that allowing people to see the darker aspects of myself and the things that I question in myself will just make it a little easier for people to start peering into that part of themselves. Mm. I appreciate that. I want to ask you about how your background as a woman of color, as a Caribbean woman, like how this factors into your perspective. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because um, I know you have you have a Caribbean background yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Jamaica. And I think it really changes your um perspective on race Mm -hmm. because because I feel like I'm Trinidadian Mm -hmm. and race is a construct. It just helps you see race as a construct so much clearer because Mm -hmm. race isn't viewed the same way in Trinidad as it is here. Mm -hmm. It's, It's a construct. It's an incredibly important construct, but it can be harder when you grow up in a system where it almost seems like it's a like natural reality to mm. be able to see that. So I think I have a little bit of a unique perspective um, coming for a con- from a country that does have racial tension, yes. but does not have the same type of imbalance and like hierarchy mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. the United States have. So, so there's definitely like structural problems, but mm-hmm. I don't think the dynamic is not n- nearly as violent because the power imbalance is not such a prominent aspect of culture. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that affected me in a lot of ways. And the way I also view religion, because in Trinidad, we would celebrate like all the holidays. Mm -hmm. Um, We would celebrate the Hindu holidays and the Christian holidays, the Muslim holidays. Mm -hmm. But I also think that it's where a lot of my distinct feelings of being between two selves comes from. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of through lines between like being a child and not necessarily being American or being Trinidadian and this like an adult self being like, I want this thing, but I also want this thing and they don't, Mm -hmm. (laughs) they don't make sense together. Um, So I think through my life, that's been, that's been a theme. And that obviously Mm. comes out in this art because that's, what this art is all about. Yeah. Okay. So worlds colliding. I saw that you are also going to be speaking at a TEDx event um, in a, in LA in the, or in the SoCal area, I should say, on specialization. And I thought that was such an interesting concept. I wonder if you might, you know, give us a little bit of what you're, what you're delivering um, in your talk. So I'm going to be talking about revolutionizing art and challenging specialization um, and about how colonialism and capitalism kind of ingrained in us this idea that we should only be one thing. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a big one. That's one I struggle with in in particular, like because my whole life or even right now, it's like, are you an activist? Are you an artist? Are you a speaker? Are you a writer? But I, I don't think that I ever really connected it to colonialism. How, where's the connection here? I think that in, in different cultures, in a lot of indigenous cultures, we participate in a lot of different aspects of life. And we don't need to be tied to one thing in particular. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of indigenous cultures, we would have like religious leaders, but that's not their entire, like their entire life isn't being the religious leader. 
Right. And I think the even stronger tie is to capitalism because Mm -hmm. we worship productivity. Mm. So because we worship productivity, the way to be most productive, we've decided, Mm. is to specialize. So Mm -hmm. instead of a clockmaker going through the entire process of making a clock, feeling very tied to the creation of this whole we have sort of like cogs in a machine, right? You have someone mm-hmm. that does this one thing and then mm-hmm. someone else that does this one thing. And I think it really disconnects people from themselves and also mm-hmm. from each other and from humanity mm-hmm. because we are so laser focused on One very small aspect of the entire human experience. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say specialization is bad. Like we need neurosurgeons. They're great Mm -hmm. and they need to be very (laughs) specialized to do what they do. But we also shouldn't feel like we have to do one thing. And that's what we need to spend 40 hours a week doing. Yes. Because that's why like most of us don't know where our food comes from. Most Mm. of us don't don't know what the, like where our, most of our stuff comes from really. Mm -hmm. And I think it really limits our perspective and it also limits our joy because Mm. we feel like, well, I couldn't do that because like I'm a musician I'm not an artist. Like for most Mm. of my life, for most of my life, I was like, I'm a musician. I have to focus on that thing. If I'm ever going to be successful, I need to focus on this one thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be the best at it that I can be. And then a few years ago, one of my mentors was like, do you do any visual art? And I was like, no, I don't do that. Mm. And then she was like, well, you should try it because I feel like, you would be really good at it. And I was like, no, I don't like have the brain for that. But it was someone I really trusted. And so I tried it. And I realized that including visual art in my artistic process didn't actually take energy or creativity away from my musical process. Mm. It actually just enhanced my musical process. So I think I, I used to see this like this pool of um, this finite pool of creativity Mm. and of ideas. And I thought the more things you do, it would be like cutting it up like a pie. Yeah. But I think it actually just multiplies things. So to sum it up, (laughs) some of my talk, I'm I'm just talking about why um, I think we should all feel freer to be more than one thing. Right. I mean, you know, there's so many ways that I feel like this can land, but the way that it lands for me right now, for people who are listening, or the thing that I that I hope that people hear too when they're listening, is so often when we talk about like making the world better, that there are also people who feel like there's a special class of people who do that, you know? Like there are specialists, mm, there are yeah. specialists who work on making making the world better, and I'm not one of them. So I don't really have a role to play, you know? Yeah. Or they might listen and say, well, Andre does that. You know, people like Andre do that. You know, people right. like Trish do that, you know, and the thing that I really hope that everyone who engages with this work understands is that, like, at least I really mean it when I say we need millions of ordinary, organized, outraged people 100%. to make this happen. Cutting some of that time out of our lives to really engage in, in this work, personal and structural, you know, to make the world better. Uh, I am like so sad that we're running low on time because there's so much more I want to ask you, but I'm just going to ask you two more questions. The first is, what keeps you going? What keeps you showing up to do your work? I feel like I have a really strong support system Mm. that believes in what I'm doing. And I think I text my best friend about giving up like every other week. (laughs) But um, I think mostly it's focusing on purpose is what helps me regain my bearings. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think it's really easy to start, at least for me, it's really easy to start thinking about my social media engagement. And mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's really easy for me to get off course wanting people to absorb my art because I want attention. 
Mm. But when I start thinking, no, that's not, that's not why you're doing any of this. Right. When I start thinking about that, then you're like, oh, so every decision I have to make, I would like that decision to contribute to my purpose. Yeah. And if it's contributing to my purpose, then I'm doing my job. And whatever happens next isn't in my control. But I think focusing on purpose is really what connects me to the greater good, to the universe, to like the the sum of the parts. And that's been the practice of reshifting my focus to what is your purpose has been invaluable. Wonderful. And where can people keep up with your work and what you're doing? Well, they can join my email list at trishes.com. I'm definitely trying to connect with people a lot more outside of social media Mm -hmm. because I don't know if social media is that good for us, but but you can also find me on all the social media (laughs) (laughs) Um, at Trish's Music. Yeah, so you can go to my website, trishes.com. You'll find all the things. You can join my email list, watch some of my videos. Wonderful. Um, Well, again, Trish, thanks so much for being on the show. Everyone listening, the name is Trish's, and you can find uh, her album, The Id, on all streaming platforms. Make sure that you go. (laughs) Make sure that you go to her website and join her email list, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much for listening today. If you like what you heard and you haven't already, please subscribe on your favorite podcatcher. Also, leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts helps us get into more ears and minds. You can find all the links in the show notes for today's guest, as well as Andre's newsletter, Patreon, and book. You can connect with Andre on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at the Andre Henry. That's all for this episode of the Hope and Hard Pills podcast. We'll see you next time.